Just a little bit of background on genome editing. I think this is helpful for those that, that aren't really working on these tools every day. Um, so this is a naturally occurring system. Um, you would not believe how many billions of copies of this are in this room right now. They're part of our microbiomes and, and, and our microbes. If you imagine the market cap on this and, and how much you're worth, um, it's, it's really kind of fun to, to think about and do that math. Um, but, but the way these systems develop, are, it's, it's a way for bacteria to have an immune system. So they don't have antibodies and white blood cells to help them defend against infection. But what they do have is, is CRISPR-Cas systems. So a, a virus here, this, this little guy in the, the top corner, inserts his DNA into the bacteria to attack it. And that bacteria can cut up that viral DNA, make a copy of it, and insert that almost in a, in a, like a library into its own genome as a memory of that infection so that its offspring, um, the next time they're infected with a virus, it'll say, okay, I have a copy of this virus, I've seen it before, I'm gonna cut it up and neutralize it. So this is, this is a defense. And what was the big, really, innovation about five years ago, Jennifer Doudna, Feng Zhang, and others, recognized that instead of using this viral DNA, what you could do is program any piece of DNA that you want as a guide to take this editor to a place that you'd like to in the genome. And using editing parlance, you could delete a gene, or you can copy-paste and insert a new gene. So this is an incredibly powerful technology. So let's start to think about what does the surprise look like? What's the Sputnik of this type of work? So thinking of a bacterial system, what could we maybe program in mass into a bacteria? Enter George Church. And of course, he has taken every single picture in this moving image and mapped a genome sequence to it, uploaded that sequence in the rapid upload time of about three days into a bacteria. Um, and this is, this is on a loop. It's a very short segment. But each and every one of those pixels um, has been programmed into a DNA. And the, your readout from that system is, is sequencing that bacteria. So this is starting to show you what these technologies may enable one day. Is it DNA data storage? Well, the, the price of synthesis isn't yet at a price point that this is realistic in the next year or two, but maybe in the next 10 or 20 years it is realistic. There's a window of opportunity here that we can start to build in encryption systems, ways that we can start to, to protect this information if we want to, as a nation, use these technologies. Beyond that, it turns out that CRISPR-Cas9 is almost like a one-size-fits-all editor. I, I don't think CRISPR-Cas has met an organism yet that it can't edit. So um, from salamanders to pigs to rodents to bacteria, um, when you start to think about what we can edit now, we can think of editing these things as systems, as maybe entire ecosystems. Maybe creating new ecosystems of the future or reviving ecosystems from the past, learning from them. Um, there's folks in this room <laughs> that are interested in, in de-extinction, bringing back things like the woolly mammoth um, out of the context of their original ecosystem. Maybe it makes sense to not only bring back the woolly mammoth, but the plant life that that woolly mammoth may have enjoyed. So thinking about de-extinction, there is a time sometimes as a society that we decide to eliminate something from our environment. Um, smallpox is one example of something that, that we have eliminated because of the incredible suffering and, and death that that brought to individuals. C countries still maintain stockpiles for, for fear of resurgence. And you may have heard recently that Canadian researchers actually reconstituted an extinct pox virus. In this case, it was a horse pox virus, um, which had also been eradicated as an agricultural pest. It had not been detected anywhere in the wild since the 1980s. And so as a society, collectively, we have eradicated these, these species of virus, and the one individual or small group of individuals has made the decision to, to bring that pox virus back. So I, I, I want to emphasize that the power of small groups of individuals here using these technologies is, is immense, and it's important that we get the word out thinking about, you know, I'm not sure if somebody said in this context, what could possibly go wrong <laughs> if we bring back a horsepox virus? And, it, you know, it's funny, but it's not funny. <laughs> um, you know, how do we address this going forward? And, I, 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 you know, again, emphasizing, thinking about the power of one, genome editors can be applied to even bias the outcomes of inheritance in something that's called a gene drive. 
What a gene drive does is it couples a trait of interest with a genome editor. In this case, if you want to suppress something like a mosquito that's a carrier of, of vector-borne diseases like malaria or, or dengue, you can couple a trait that, say, that makes a mosquito resistant to, to malaria um, with CRISPR-Cas. And so through reproduction, it makes a copy of itself um, into the, the sister chromato chromosome, so where mom and dad each would have a different copy now, Dad's copy gets copied into mom's copy, and, and there's 100% there's inheritance of your trait of interest. So for something like vector-borne disease, you may want to use a tool like this, and people have heralded, okay, we now have the technology to destroy all Zika mosquitoes, or name your favorite vector-borne disease. Um, but at the same time, we have now created for the first time a tool that can lead to extinction. So under what circumstances do we decide to use this tool and understand you know, how this might work in the environment. Um, and you know, is there a way to do this in a, in a measured way that we maybe can do a local extinction and, and not a global extinction? These were some of the questions that I brought to the community to ask, you know, how can we move forward safely in this world? Um, and then finally, of course, uh, human uses of these technologies. There's a lot of people are afraid to use the, the C word, the cure word for cancers here, but um, it really looks like an application of these technologies through um, some T cell therapies and otherwise can reverse cancer even at very late stages. Industry that makes transgenic organisms for research tools um, use these same exact reagents to cause disease in animals. I don't think you need to be a biosecurity expert to recognize that there is a need for scrutiny um, when you look at a tool that can both cure and cause, the and cause a disease. Thank you.